Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 78 of the Friday Nightmares podcast. I am one half of your hosting team this evening, Mr. Smoke Show Crawford, coming to you from the town of Swartz Creek in the county of Genesee, in the state of Michigan, in the United States of America, in the North American continent, in the Western Hemisphere, on the planet Earth, in the Milky Way galaxy. I'm fully vaxxed, boosted, and waxed, and ready to climax. And if you can, please get me wet and feed me after midnight. I'm the man with the glorious beard, a.k.a. Mother of Cats, a.k.a. the man with the humongous ego, a.k.a. Scott Housen, a.k.a. Scotty Too Hottie, a.k.a. Spanky, a.k.a. the Golden God, a.k.a. the Traitor. Because of Tim <laughs> Davis hurting my feelings on the last Dummies of Horror episode. <laughs> and, <laughs> and with me, as always, is... Heather Powell, coming from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. Also known as That Bitch from Horror... No, Dummies of Horror. And they had a poll recently. And I was on the poll. And I didn't win, which I was a little <laughs> upset about. <laughs> uh, I'm always on the poll. I actually do have a stripper poll. So I am on that poll, and we all know I like the other poll, so both of those statements are correct. But no, I think I only got five votes, and one of them was me voting for myself. So um, <laughs> see, I was a little I, disappointed. I couldn't vote for you just because you're not that you're not that bitch to me. No, I, I'm actually not a bitch to them either. It's just no, kind of a... <laughs> it's just their thing, but... But no, like to me, I'd be like, I couldn't do that just because I would never call you that bitch. That that's just not me. And plus, no, Mrs. No. Deagle was on there from Gremlins, and she's the biggest bitch of them all. Well, and like if we're the biggest bitch is Tim. Tim whining oh. about wrestling. And like, you know, he just is whine, 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 all the time. <laughs> whine, whine, whine. It's kind of like Rob Humphreys is whine, 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 whine. It's big whiners. But a big thank you to those two for coming on our wrestling show, our one night stand number yeah. two, you up. Um, we had a really good time with them and we're going to try to do that quarterly. It's hard to do with our schedule sometimes, but we do have a date booked in June that we will be recording again. Uh, so I'm excited for that. I always, I yeah. really do enjoy connecting with them. They're a lot of fun. Um, yeah, really, it's, two it good was, dudes. Two good yeah, dudes. It was super fun. And for me, super easy to edit because our conversation was just, because we're all good friends, our mm -hmm. conversation just flowed. We didn't have to have to like no weird pauses or anything else to worry about. Like it just was natural. I loved it. We and also next time I will have a better sounding mic. <laughs> hey, don't feel self conscious about that, Scotty. We have what we have. We're just we're not to the uh, the podcasters that are shown in some of those horror movies that are like the Joe Rogan type. We're more of the <laughs> hanging out in the basement and doing this as a true hobby type. And um. What was I going to say? But also, we we record with video on, and I think that really makes a difference. Like, if you're it looking does. at starting a podcast, I strongly recommend video where possible. Because I've done them with and without video, and let me tell you, being able to see Scotty's reactions or our guest's reactions to things makes it way easier. Yeah, and it's uh you don't stumble over each other a lot of the time i mean yeah there still is a bit of that but it's way less than if you don't have the uh, camera on because you can't see someone getting ready to say something or get ready to see some or see their face knowing that they're about to like stop saying what you know what they're talking about and you can jump chime in you can also react in the moment like exploding heads yes. records with camera on as well um, and I do think that is a huge advantage. I really, really do. And I think Daniel and Tim do as well. Yeah. And I think that just makes the, the flow so much easier. Because really you does. can also, like, expression-wise, if J Scotty makes a joke, it's funnier because I'm watching whatever he's doing making that joke. So then I'm laughing more about it than if it was just, like, a verbal thing without any kind of visual cues. So I think that that is really really important um to be able to do that and make sure you have that kind of connection yeah it definitely is so but yeah we have a couple of 2023 movies that we need to get caught up on um so yeah we got one two three four five six seven eight, nine, ten, 13 to talk about look at so us <laughs> I, and we think we watched the majority of the same ones haven't we 
Uh, yeah, there's a couple on here I have not either finished or I have not watched, but uh, all but all in all, the majority of them I think we've all seen. Well, and we're going back in time with some of these too because it's been a little bit of time since we've watched them. Right. So, why don't we start with the first one? We watched this one. This was a Tubi one that we watched when we were kind of, I don't want to say desperate, <laughs> We were trying to find things to watch, and it is this land. Should I do the promo for it or introduction? I guess. Oh, um, sure. Started. Yeah. All right. So this is a hundred and six minute runtime. You can find this joy on Tubi. Uh, divided they fall. Two families from opposite ends of the political spectrum turn on each other after com after cabin rental mix up, but must work together to survive after a sinister group emerges with an ancient past um yeah what did you think of this this was a while ago um from what i can remember i had fun with it it was uh definitely an easy watch but uh yeah you could definitely say they picked two sides like you they picked the far left and the far right of the political spectrum it's not just like com- like completely opposite as they come mm-hmm. and put them in a situation but uh yeah there was a lot of stupid choices made throughout it um like just decisions on what they decided to do and a uh, couple of uh things that I would go and you wouldn't do that after what this character had been through but all in all like I still find it find it yeah, found it enjoyable had some good gore some good kills had some good suspense to it there were just some points where I was just kind of rolling my eyes like all right people this I mean I know this is a horror film but come on like some of these decisions are a bit far reaching like when the whole cabin rental cabin mix up comes up and they're like oh we'll just both stay here no no I I would just be going you know what you guys keep it we'll go to a hotel I'm not going to just force ourselves upon something like that But, you know, besides, like, some of the stupid decisions, it was still an entertaining watch. It was weird. It was like this low-budget film that was low-budget but not. I don't know. It was weird. It started off kind of one way. And then in the third act, it, like, did the zoo-zoo around, so it went absolutely crazy. Um, And it was very, very, I don't know. It was hard to kind of put your finger on what kind of movie. (laughs) Like, what? What were they going for? Like, there was almost this weird political stuff that they sewed in there. But at the end of the day, it had nothing to do with anything. Right. You know, and I I didn't really get that. I felt like they were trying to do a political movie, but then they did this twist with an outside group that really wasn't political. I don't think they were political. Um, And I don't know. It just, it kind of went, it kind of just went weird for me. It was in a bad movie, but it was a weird, weird movie. Yeah. Like, I mean... For a Tubi watch and just something to kill the time, like, it was perfectly fine. That's how I looked at it anyways, because I was like, because uh, Eric and I watched this together while we were uh, doing one of our Tubi Tuesday date nights. And, yeah, we poked fun at it, but we also had fun with it. Right, right. And speaking of poking fun but having fun with, I guess we can move on to the next one. Uh, that is Night of the Bastard. From, oh, uh, yes. Uh, I remember you it. recommended this, kind of, kind of. Yeah. Uh, it's got an 82-minute runtime, and the synopsis is, after an injured young woman takes refuge in his secluded home, a gruff recluse must fight off a bloodthirsty cult and an insatiable sorceress to save both of their lives. A battle to survive becomes a gripping race against the clock to escape a perverse ritual of blood and flesh. So, yeah, this was just, I once again, like we were talking about the cover art, poster art type thing. The poster art to this kind of caught my eyes. So I was like, oh, okay. The title sounds cheesy. Why not? Let's let's check it out. And yeah, I didn't mind it. I thought it was fine. Um, once again, just some silly decisions made. Um, and it was a bit over the top, and the bad guys mm. and characters were all a little bit over the top. But the gore in it was pretty awesome. Um, and for the people that this matters to, it does have some nudity. But uh, like all in all, like I found this like the uh, chemistry between the gruff old man or the gruff loner dude and the injured young woman. It's nothing groundbreaking, but I thought they had a pretty good chemistry together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but like, it was like that same old, same old, like kind of like different opinions cl- clashing, but they get along at the same time and look after each other. And yeah, like I thought it was mainly just 
fun for all the gore that was in it and just like the kills and stuff like that. Yeah, I would agree with you. It's funny. These last two movies are very similar with the whole pulled marmises at the end of the yeah. day. Both of them low budget. I do agree with you that the gore in this one was better than this land. Um, I think you liked it more than I did, but I did appreciate what they were going for. And for a lot of people, like I looked it up, this was their first acting gigs or writing gigs and stuff. So like, you know, if this is like your first kick at the can, it's not horrible, but I probably wouldn't recommend it to anyone. It is available on iTunes, Google, Vudu, YouTube, and Microsoft store. I don't know, unless you're a filmmaker and you want to see how other people make films, rent it. Otherwise, I don't know. That's my thoughts. What do you think, Scott? I'd say $0.99 cent to a $1.99 rental tops. Okay. Like, nothing amazing. Once again, just something easy to watch and just kind of fun with the gore. Yeah. Right? Um, it's – and the thing is, movies like this don't usually go for a $0.99 cents to a $1.99 rental, do they? They're usually, like, no. six ninety nine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like unless like unless they've been out for a couple of years, then yeah, sure. right. So anyway, the next one that we have on our list is Missing. Um, now, I, did you watch Missing? Did you get a I chance? To? Oh, nice. I kind of want to hear your thoughts. What did you What did you think? I really loved this. So, oh, nice. Missing is the sequel to Searching, which I never did watch Searching, but I know a lot of people loved it, and I know Tim Davis absolutely, absolutely loved this film. And it takes a different perspective. Instead of it being a a father trying to find his daughter, it is a daughter trying to find her mother. And And the whole process of this whole thing and everything she's going through to find where her, after she went on vacation... Mm-hmm. And just the twists and turns it takes, it kept me guessing left and right. And I kept being wrong over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Like I did not, I did not see the reveal at the end coming. I agree. It was a great twist. Um, oh, I know Dave Bailey's like a spider. Um, this is a 111 minute runtime and it definitely does not overstay its welcome. And this is found footage done right. This whole thing is found footage. She is either on her webcam or looking at videos or talking to someone through FaceTime. Fucking, like, fucking slow cap for this being one of the better found footage movies that have come out in a long time. It was, it was social media found footage done right. And looking at the reviews on the letterbox with the exception of Dave Bailey, who, I don't know, Dave Bailey didn't like it. Probably because, like, this is below him. Because he's much smarter than us. But Dave C. dug it. You dug it. Tim Davis dug it. Um, Catherine and Kevin, who are a lovely husband and wife couple that are fans of many podcasts, dug it. Um, There's a lot of podcasters that have seen this, a lot of people that have watched it that have dug it. So when I see stuff like that, it kind of gives me kind of affirmation that I'm not alone in digging this film. I think this film is worth a rental. Um, It is available on Cineplex here in Canada to rent. Definitely, if you feel like watching a home movie, it's worth it. It's also available on iTunes, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft Store. And I would say enter any rental price. It is an entertaining, good movie. It's probably light on the the horror, which is fine. You know, it does, I guess, get more horror-ish in the third act. But I, I dug it, and I think it's worth seeing. It's one of the highlight films of this year when it comes to entertainment factor. And social media oh, done right, right? Like, and uh, it's a bit of a, and it's a bit emotional too. It is emotional. Really good acting. Really, really good acting. Um, everybody did a really good job, especially with this just being mostly through FaceTime for yeah. a lot of it. Like, really, really good job. So, yeah, totally recommend it. And um, this next one, I have not seen. Okay, hashtag year of babies. All right, this is <laughs> this is the year of. Movies about people with babies. And I am going to say that I think this film is supposed to be about a father having postpartum. Interesting. So this movie is called Noise. It is on Netflix. It is a 90-minute runtime. Um, Matt, an influencer and young parent to newborns, Julius discovers he has a dark secret from his demented father's past. Um, he started in indefinite vacation, which opens Pandora's box of secrets and reveals more family drama than anticipated. So the premise is this guy with his wife, they're, they're both like, I think internet influencers, only she has like a 
bakery business. I, I honestly don't know how they pay their bills because they don't seem to be having a lot of money coming in, but they seem to be living a very lavish lifestyle. But anyway, they're mm. living in the family property. Obviously, the family comes from wealth. Um, and there's a past there about what happened mm-hmm. to this gentleman's mother when she gave birth, some postpartum stuff. And what he starts going through, so usually where we see it's the mother, in this case, it's him. Interesting. It is interesting. It has a 1.5 rating on Letterboxd. No one besides me has watched it. So I thought it was a very interesting drama. I thought that it, you know, tried to portray this father as a person that you're unsure of what issue he is struggling with at that time but i don't think it's something that netflix has put out that people should go run out and watch gotcha okay i think that it was more of a drama and it was interesting but by no stance would i say oh man this is a go watch but if you are interested in seeing what i perceived as the male side of postpartum and slash mental illness you can watch noise on Netflix. Okay. Yeah, this I, I will probably give it a watch just because like I'm just kind of filling in my gaps a little bit and just just because of what you said that kind of intrigues me. So I'll, I'll yeah, check this it's, out. It's interesting is the key word I would keep using. Yeah. A lot. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> All right. So I will jump on one. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right, so the next movie I'm going to talk about is Kill Her Goats. It has a 100-minute runtime. Uh, tagline is, no body is safe. The synopsis, Audra's graduation gift is her dream house, but it soon becomes a living nightmare when some uninvited guests come to her homecoming party who aren't very subtle about the fact that they don't pr- approve of the home's new owner. <sighs> well, <laughs> right off the bat, I should have looked up this director's name because if I seen what he did before this, mm-hmm. I would have avoided this movie at all costs. Oh, you knew him. I didn't know him by name, but when I realized what he directed before this, yeah. So he directed a movie called Muck. And if you remember correctly, um, what is it? Uh, the horror cast, when they did their yearly award show, they would have what they called the Muck Award which was the worst film of the year. (laughs) Because Muck was so abysmal, Mark Nato made an award called the Muck Award. Wow, that bad, huh? Yeah. Well, for one, that movie, it just jumps you right in the middle of a slasher, basically. It's basically saying, this is part two, and you're not going to see part one. Maybe eventually I'll make a part one to it. But it's like, it jumps in, you don't know any of the characters, and they're running away from a killer. You have no idea why. And it's just horrible acting, pointless nudity, blah, blah, blah. Well, and it was just bad. Bad, 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 bad. Bad, bad, Um, bad, bad. I barely even made it through the movie. Um, This one, I shouldn't have watched it all the way through, but that was at work. I was sidetracked. I let it go. This movie is just as fucking bad, if not worse. The director must just be a fucking horny teenage boy that gets his jollies off on hiring penthouse models to do up-close shots of boobs, asses, and just women in bikinis and showering. (laughs) And, like, even during, like, tense scenes where there is, like, this killer... Um, the camera will be set at this angle where when a girl walks in the shot, you're staring at her ass. <laughs> it's like, okay, like, I, you know, I don't mind like nudity and all that stuff. Like, and especially I don't mind pointless nudity. I grew up in the fucking eighties with horror films. Yeah. But yeah. Come on now. This was just dumb. The acting is abysmal. Um, the storyline made no fucking sense. They started off at there. I'm going to spoil shit here because I don't give a fuck. But uh, there were one killer and then another killer shows up in the last like 15 minutes and has nothing to do with anything. And it's just like, why? What, what was the point of all of this? None of the plot made any damn sense. The location was just blah. Like they say dream home. Well, if her dream home is some rundown cabin in the woods, okay. Um, <laughs> 
and yeah. She even like for the first like twenty minutes or so, this girl, it's like this film is following this woman around and she's monologuing everything she is going to do. So she's in the house and you know, just looking around and she's going, Oh, I should go get the groceries and then go take a shower after that. Oh, what's that outside? And then she sees a dock and she goes walking out to the dock. And then as she's walking out to the dock, she's bouncing up and down on the dock going, I got a dock. I got a dock. I got a dock. And then she goes, but there's scary things in there with sharp teeth. I'm not going to go swimming in that water. Ooh. What? <laughs> she's not telling anybody this. She's just saying this out loud to herself. And... <laughs> <laughs> I, I I swear I lost brain cells. Like, this is just bad. I I heard a similar review on the Dummies of Horror podcast, and honestly, I I think it. You know, if you want to make a, a a movie with sexy chicks, that's what you do, I guess, right? And somebody out there is going to watch it, but it doesn't sound like it's a horror film. It sounds like it's a should be a porno with maybe some more sex in it. Right, because like you either go all the way with it or cut back a little bit and maybe add a little more story. Yeah, like, yeah. Even like porns it, have story. Yeah, and this is about porn level of story. And but the thing is, like once again, I was fooled by the cover art on this one because I thought the the cover art looked pretty cool. I was like, okay, this looks like an like throwback to an '80s slasher film. Down. And well, the, yeah, the gore. He is shaking his fist at you. See, oh, he thing. sure is. You know what, Scotty? That's what I tell you about cover art. <laughs> yeah, he sure is right on that one. But uh, I will. Tim Davis also said the same thing, so I'll, I agree with him on this. The gore was decent, not many great kills, but it just what a fucking dumb movie. Yeah, and yeah. It's nowhere to rent or anything like that, so audience, you're lucky. But when <laughs> it does become available, don't bother. I love it. So skip over this one is what you're saying. It, yeah, and uh, vert your eyes if it's playing anywhere, like on TV or something. Or change <laughs> the channel fast. I love it. That's awesome, Scotty. Well, I also, I watched, so did you. Um, well, I got about halfway through this one. Oh, I did still, you? Okay, well, you, you, I don't know. Yet. You can comment on what you think. Uh, I guess that says a lot if you got halfway through and you haven't gone back to it, huh? <laughs> well, no, I've just been a, it's just been a really busy week at work. I have not had a chance to watch anything. Yeah, I feel that. All right, so this movie is called Leave. It is one of the more recent shutter drops, so something did drop this Friday, uh, that we're recording this previous Friday. This is a 106-minute runtime. Her heritage is haunting her. A young woman tries to find her origins after having been abandoned as an infant at a cemetery wrapped in a cloth with satanic symbols. But as she gets closer to the answer, a spirit, a living spirit, is telling her to leave. Um, this movie was fine enough. Okay, if you got Shudder and you enjoy ghosty movies, this is obviously a ghosty movie. I think you will dig it. The acting is good enough, but this is a paint-by-numbers plot that you see coming 18 miles away. If you have ever watched a horror film before, you know what's going to happen in this movie. Oh, boy. If your friend has ever watched a horror film before, horror movie before, and they tell you about a plot, you are going to know what's going to happen in this movie. It's not anything that is going to be, you know, super brilliant, but it is entertaining enough. If you like ghost movies, you got the shuddy, and you feel like throwing something on, go ahead, but don't expect to be wowed. This is available on AMC, all the shutters, and DirecTV. I suggest only watching if you have the shuddy, and if you're like Scotty and I that watch basically everything. Um, <laughs> if that's what we do. <laughs> right. Yes. We watch all Shutter releases, new releases, generally speaking. Yeah, well, I was saying, uh, with this one, I am about halfway through. Um, and, yeah, I find it okay so far. Um, just really nothing happened, like, so far. Like, uh, well, I mean, stuff happens, but nothing horror has happened yet. So I'm kind of curious to see what that is all about. So I will, yeah. I will try to finish it, because I think this week at work will be a little lighter. Fingers yeah. crossed. You know, you got to get into that shutter, huh? I do. I was like, because I'm a little behind because I have an, another new one came out this week that you watched that I have not seen yet. Oh, the census. All the census soon. We'll be talking about all my number one movies just have to do with census. This yes, year. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anything that's unsomething, but you got something that you got to put on here. 
pretty exciting. A long-awaited sequel, I'm pretty sure, to this masterpiece. Oh, absolutely. So, this is the sequel, Sorority Babes in the Slimeball Bolarama Part 2. This movie was a sequel to one from the 80s. It is on, uh, it is available on Tubi, and it was only 61 minutes, so I was like, eh, all right, I'll watch it, because I found the original Slimeball Bolarama one entertaining. It's silly, Mm -hmm. it's dumb, but it was entertaining. It had, like, that 80s cheese to it. Um, But uh, the synopsis is, the babes are back. And so is everyone's favorite wish-granting, murder-loving, mischievous gremlin, the imp. The tri-Delta sorority house has seen better days, but the girls are intent on gaining some new recruits. With house mother Mama Spider as their guide, the sexy hijinks and hilarity begin. Meanwhile, though, the Bolarama bowling alley has had a break-in and a breakout. With the escape of the magical and murderous imp, it's a new, no holds barred <laughs> fight for survival, and only one mysterious girl holding the answers to the riddle of the imp's wish. Oy, oy, oy. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, this is the week of, or the episode of Scotty regrets his decisions because this one, yeah, this was bad. Um, because <laughs> once again, this is another. I shouldn't once again. Scotty should have known better. Full moon came up as the people behind this movie and i'm going you know full moon in the 80s hell yeah okay this could be fun full moon nowadays usually goes oh boy okay this is gonna be bad and really cheap and yeah this was so just it took them like it's 60 minute long movie took them about a half hour to even get to the bowling alley and then the effects were dumb the shit Mm. that goes down is dumb and then it just kind of abruptly ends. Like, that's it? That's how you defeat the imp? Huh? <laughs> what? Really? That's how, we're do- that's how we're doing this? Okay. I love your face. Your face is the best. You're like, what? How? This, why? Once again, I blame that I'm watching these at work, and that's why I let these go longer than they should. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this is an avoid. This was nothing special whatsoever. Uh, I should like I like I always make fun of Lego sequels and to do a Lego Lego sequel legacy sequel or whatever y'all call it yeah yeah to this movie that was just okay from the 80s yeah once again Scotty should have known better but once again it was only an hour long so what could it hurt it hurt my brain is what it could do <laughs> <laughs> where can you where if someone decides they want to torture themselves where can they watch it Scotty uh, this is available on Tubi and Rob I do not recommend oh, no. watch this. Rob, oh, do my, my not memory. watch Sorority Babes oh. at the Slime Ball Bolarama You know he's going to watch it. This is why I'm saying it. But don't but watch it, it Rob. Um, <laughs> thank God we have these recorded to prove that we tell him not to watch these films that he just goes and watches anyway. Exactly. Honestly. <laughs> and then he blames me saying they're my number one films. Yeah, well, we're going to hear about my number one film. <laughs> oh, yeah, we right are. Right here. It's funny, Scott. Okay, so since Scott now has a girlfriend, and for <laughs> all of you who are Facebook friends with him, you know it's serious because he updated his profile pic to the picture of her and him, which I have literally in the four years I have known him and the one or two women that he's courted in that time or seen, has he ever posted a picture? I don't even think... I've ever seen anyone in his profile pictures. Have you ever posted profile pictures with other people? Uh, just my parents a long time ago. Like, not even your ex-wife? <laughs> did you oh, have? Oh, yeah. I think I did have one with my ex-wife, like, our wedding photo or something like that. Okay, fair enough. Wow. So, Erica, fucking feel privileged because <laughs> it takes... A lot to make it to a Scotty Too Hottie Smoke Show profile picture. So he now also keeps his hat backwards all the time <laughs> and has become, <laughs> has become very confident. Obviously, Erica has rubbed off on him and done some <laughs> magic. So the confidence that Scott already had, like he's now like, you know, the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. When, like, oh, it's so cute, and then, like, you say nice things to it, and it gets a little bigger, and now it's, like, destroying cities and shit. (laughs) I'm running away from the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, and it's Scott coming after me, making fun of me about this film. That's what's happening right now. (laughs) So just so we're clear, let's set the stage, okay? So the next movie we're going to talk about is a Blumhouse, Bloomhouse classic. 
called Unseen. It is a 76-minute runtime. Sight is survival. Sam receives a call from Emily, a near-blind woman who is running from her murderous ex in the woods. Can she survive using her eyes via video call? Scotty did not like this movie. I thought this movie was fluffy good times, okay? Um, Despite what Scott thinks, it is not my number one pick of the year. Uh, It is my number two pick of the year. (laughs) No, this is Heather's number one film. She's going to go out and buy all the merch. She's going to get autographs from all the people in it. Yeah, This this is her, their reach of Everybody remembers when that they reach. Everybody remembers her ripping on me about that one. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is what's happened. This is actually the film I'm going to do a fan film in dedication of it because I liked it so much. Um, despite what negative Nelly here has to say about this fucking film, I thought it was actually pretty entertaining for a 76 minute runtime. What you see is what you get. This chick who works in the most ridiculous gator gas station, which, by the way, that shit exists in Florida. I have driven through Florida and gone through a gas station that looked just like that. I'm pretty sure they just found a gas station in Florida and they were like, you might we film a movie here. We pay you. And they were like, all right. And I liked the main protagonist quite a bit, Scott. I thought she was quite lovely. And, you know, she eventually stood up for herself. Maybe, maybe you're just a shamer. Maybe you're just a bully. Like those other American assholes that show up at the gas station. Let me be clear Um, here. I had nothing against the two main characters. It was the third fucking act. See, which I loved the third act. I thought the third act was awesome. Yeah, so I, watching this, I'm going, okay, this feels kind of like C for me a bit, like uh, that movie from last year. I was like, okay, you know, this, it's okay. It's not bad. And, like, it's taking itself all serious. And then the third act happens and it goes, serious? Nah, what's serious? Let's be silly and have like all this random shit happen in the gas station that t- I, it's all just one like ridiculous thing after another. And I'm like, why are we do- doing this? What this just threw this movie completely off the rails for me. Like I was just like, I, I, what, what, huh? Uh. <laughs> now, because I don't love the movie enough to advocate that much for it, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just sorry that. Now you're so cocky that you can't bring yourself down to, like I bet you Erica would like this movie. I bet you oh, no, think it be was you. Fun of it. She no. would be making fun of it. No, she would appreciate the two female protagonists because she's pro woman and she's on my side here, for sure. Women versus Scott. <laughs> uh, well. I mean, and and you can't say I like have like think I have better taste or anything. I mean, look at the garbage I just talked about. The oh, last two weeks, so and like that would involve me arguing that this is like the best movie around, and it certainly is not. It's your number one film. I it's mean, my number it. one film. Rob Fundry's gonna it. watch that now too, and he's gonna be like, "You thought that was the number one film of 2022, and it was so stupid, and I didn't like it because my name's Rob." And I don't make anything. I swear to God. <laughs> he probably gets a blowjob and complains about it. He's like, I didn't like that. It wasn't sloppy enough for me. It wasn't <laughs> that good. Nothing. Nothing makes Rob happy except for Crocs and Taylor Swift records. And CM so, Punk. CM Punk. Um, no, nothing wrestling makes him happy either. Listen to our Friday Nightmares wrestling podcast. You can hear Rob just complain about everything. I don't even think he's like <laughs> one thing in wrestling except for House of Black. And that's like Ink Master Shop Wars. So, right? Oh, anyway. Still bite my tongue. Good times, good times. So, this is a Bloomhouse movie. Blumhouse, Bloomhouse. And it is very much for the teenagers. So, I don't know. If you choose joy, then watch it. If you choose hate, then don't. So, either you're Scotty, you're Team Scotty, or you're Team Heather. If you it's choose just- sanity, Save yourself. Don't watch it. It's available on iTunes, Google, Amazon, YouTube, Cineplex. And I enjoyed it for what it was, but I don't think it's worth a rental. I would watch it for free. So what Heather is saying here is she has watched way too many bad 2023 movies, and she's seen a glimpse of something good, and it's a light at the end of the tunnel, and she's like, yay! Let's go back to it. Erica, do you hear the bullying? (laughs) 
Like, I appreciate that you two are in love and shit, but, like, and I want Scotty to be happy, but, like, he's become a real meanie pants, and I expect you, <laughs> as the woman who's there, to take care of this situation for me, Erica. Uh, By any means necessary. This is just Smoke Show getting his revenge on you for bullying me the last couple of years. And you know what? She's going to be doing some crazy BSM, BDSM shit next time she comes up. Well, who knows? You guys might already be doing that. Who am I to judge? <laughs> right? Who am I to judge? I mean, I, mean, I do have a ball gag behind me. But no you way. say to her, you're like, oh my god, can you put this hat on basket, backwards, wear some glasses, and get an Australian accent and talk about Jaws? Yeah, baby, that's right. Mm, Tim. <laughs> Remember the scary movie where he's like banging his girlfriend oh, and yeah, then he says, like, the guy's a ball stud? Yeah! <laughs> makes her dress up in the full football outfit that's you making her dress up like tim <laughs> davis or for tubbies erica's like how does she know i know erica i know all i know everything and i so, wear a giant gizmo outfit I'm oh like, yeah i'm in a furry now i'm a furry now I wear <laughs> you're gizmo. like don't get me wet she's like oh don't trust me there will be nothing getting wet tonight <laughs> <laughs> oh dear god just you wait till you bring her up here I'm fucked. Hashtag Phil Scotty's <laughs> girl. Hashtag. Hashtag this is bullshit. Right? No. <laughs> I guess you better look at what you have to offer. Maybe you should be a little less judgmental about movies. You know? <sighs> Maybe her boys would like this movie. Her kids. They might, yeah. Right? I was saying, like, I think she would probably find it like me, where it was, you know, enjoyable enough, but at the same time, just make fun of it like I do. Or she's going to make fun of you and tell you that it's her number one movie of the year now. And then I'll have every right to make fun of her. That's right. Yeah. We don't... <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll 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 keep my snazzy comments to myself for the rest of the day. Oh, um, let's just say I hope Erica takes care of you in any form that she has to, including beatings, <laughs> including beatings. Anyway, <laughs> should we move on to the next one? Which is the part? Oh, talk about beatings. <laughs> yeah. Beatings. Hey, yeah. as long as it's consensual. What do we say on this podcast, Scotty? Yes, please. As long as it's consensual. Oh, oh, consensual. Yeah, I was just going to say, yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> oh, my God. You're like, mm, yes, Erica, may I have some more? <laughs> and she's like, can you please stop? <laughs> 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 anyway, now we're done talking about Scott's in love life that he has and his joy and happiness. Um, okay, where are we? The park. Did you watch the park? No, not yet. Okay. So the park is a... <laughs> this movie now is an 80 minute runtime um yeah tim davis talked about this and dave bailey's watched it as well dave bailey from cemetery gates podcast um it's interesting it's basically a, a coming of age movie on three kids who find themselves in an abandoned amusement park because there's been a virus that's gone out and it basically kills all the adults um this was filmed on set at the new orleans six flags Ooh. So for all my American brother and sisters, you would know that there was a horrible uh, hurricane, I believe, that flooded out Six Flags. So the whole park got fucked, and now there's some of it still standing. So that's where they filmed it, which was the favorite part of this movie for me. I thought the kid actors did a pretty good job. The dialogue was what was kind of weak. The story was a little weak. Um, but I did very much enjoy the dialogue and the low budgetness of this. I do agree with Tim's assessment of it. It's not a really strong horror film, but I think for what it was and the kid actors in it, I thought it was enjoyable enough. That being said, you really do have to kind of like these kind of, you know, restarting over as a society building up and understand it's going to be children in the roles and, you know, check your expectations for to enjoy this. Um, if not, it may not be for you. What I really don't want to see anymore is when, like, kids are in movies and people shit all over them. Um, the movie that came out last year that was filmed in the indigenous community where none of the kids were oh, actors, yeah. but someone came in to teach them how to coach. And then people were like, oh, the kids couldn't act because they couldn't be bothered to Google and understand the kids actually weren't actors. But they were part of an indigenous community. And as we all know, in North America, we real shit on our indigenous people. Right. So, you know, when it's kids in movies, I tend to have a little bit more of an, a, like, reflect, mm, flexible approach to it, I'll say. Right. When it comes to entertainment and stuff. So, but that being said, unless this is something that really floats your, your boat, I probably wouldn't recommend renting it. But if you are interested, it is available on 
iTunes, Vudu, Google, Microsoft Store, and DirecTV, and that is The Park. Right, yeah, this is one I plan on getting to at some point. Like, I am just really burnt out on a lot of the post-apocalyptic stuff, like, mainly because I think it's just been overdone, like, zombies and, uh, like, zombie movies have post-apocalyptic themes, video games dive into post-apocalyptic things all the time. It's just something that I'm just kind of burnt out on. That's why I haven't got to it yet, but I will watch it because, you know, sometimes they're good ones. So I'll, I'll have to give it a watch just to see. Um, the next one, though. Okay, so this is The Outwaters. We all die in the dark. Four travelers encounter menacing phenomena while camping in a remote stretch of the Mojave Desert. Okay, so this film I was being, uh, a lot of people were kind of comparing Comparing it to Skinamarink, and I didn't understand why at first, but now I know it's because Outwaters, just like Skinamarink, is uh, more of a experiential horror. Like, it's just a experience, you're along for the ride, and just kind of go with it. Um, the first, I'd say, because it's an hour and ten minutes long, uh, I'd say the first half hour, they do a good job of building up the characters. Um, and it's found footage, just give everybody a heads up. But, uh, yeah. Gives you a good half hour of building up the characters, getting to know them, getting to care about them, what they're doing, why they are doing what they're doing out in the uh, Mojave Desert. And then out of nowhere, something happens at night and shit just goes insane. And this film had so much potential. Like, it ends up going into a Lovecraftian nightmare theme of, like, just these cosmic horrors from beyond and all this stuff, but it is done with such a shaky cam style found footage that reminds me a lot of Blair Witch with how shaky it is, except for where in Blair Witch, you can still see a lot of what is going on. This is shot with a camera and almost like it's a flashlight. And what you get glimpses of that you can tell, like when you get to see what it is and actually can like focus on it quick enough, is fucked up and crazy. Yeah, but... Scott and I having a bonfire. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, we're, and we're real shit-faced. <laughs> 100%, yeah. But, yeah, like, the, what you do, what you can see looks insane and creepy as shit, but it's the lighting and shaky cam makes it so, like, 75% of what's happening at night is impossible to tell what's going on. And, like, Man, I would love to see like a found footage where there was more lighting because there was some really creepy shit that was going on, and I would have loved to have like experienced and actually seen what they were trying to show me. But it just was done in such a poor camera quality style. Just I couldn't get I it I didn't know what the fuck was going on half the time. Yeah, I um I feel you. I feel like this movie. You know, where people all shit on Skin of Rink or, like, praised it like it was, you know, the best film in the entire world. I don't know. Outwater showed to me that Skin of Rink ain't that special. That other people can do a similar concept. Um, I got what they were going with. I thought it was okay. I thought it was okay. I thought it was better than Skin of Rink because I felt yep. like the plot was more clear. Like, I got yep. what was going on. Um, I just thought the ending got a little too weird for me. And see, like, and boring. Like this would have, like this could have easily cemented itself in the top ten if I could have actually seen yeah. what was going on. I could, I could easily see this in my top ten because it's like totally speaks the Scotty language with Lovecraftian nightmare and fucked up shit happening. Yeah, right. Like our bonfire in the middle of nowhere. Exactly. Um, honestly, me. that would have been a highlight to this film. Exactly. It'd be kind of like me dropping the remote when I'm drunk. I can't find <laughs> it. Or, like, the batteries fall out of a remote and you're unable to figure yeah. out how to put them back in, right? It's, like, it's it's like when Scotty and I did the ghost tour and when all this drama happened with a gentleman who was homeless and his dog. As Scotty and I were, like, was filming that as a found footage and then, like, some supernatural shit happened, but then we just dropped the camera on the ground and it just, like, showed... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all you heard was music and it was like just or like us yelling and it was just staring at a tombstone that's kind of like what happened with this film it started off really promising and this got too fucking weird for me it just got too too weird for me personally but hey if you dig it wreck on man um yeah, I, I think i ended up giving this a six out of ten because i nice. liked the concept and the idea but yeah like i just wish i could see more of what was going on and like it was like because this did do the one uh 
biggest fault that most found footage films do, and that is this guy is still recording and carrying around a camera. Okay, dude, with shit like this going on, you drop the camera and fucking self-preservation kicks in. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. Yeah, I feel you. I feel you 100%. But, but like, yeah, I, so promising and just failed. It's a shame, right? And that sometimes happens with shit like this, right? Things start yeah. off being like, oh, man, this will be really good. And then, it, spoiler, is not really good at all. But where can people rent it? Sorry, or find it? Uh, this is available. Uh, mm-hmm. Apple, Vudu, Google Play, Amazon. What is this one? Redbox. Awesome. Do you recommend a rental? I didn't like it enough to recommend a rental, but what do you think? Um, I would say if you are one of those people that likes the experiential horror along the lines of Skimmerink and you're a fan of found footage, I'd say at least give it a watch. Um, I would say cheap rental, like $3.99 tops, because, you know, once again, this is indie filmmaking and this is extremely low budget, so good for them for doing something interesting just yeah they failed the execution of it for me personally but i know a lot of people fair enough got really creeped out by this film but for me i was just like man i wanted more our uh our next movie on our on our docket is scream six oh now we have a special spoiler coming up later so we'll just give a very very brief overview uh scream six continues off from where Scream 5 technically left off in terms of we're seeing similar characters, only this one is taking place in New York City, similar to Scream 2 and Scream 3, we have left Wordsboro, um, and shenanigans occur. Nev Campbell is not in this one, I will say that out front. I think everyone knew that, who's a horror fan. She uh, she yeah. does not make an appearance. I do like how they wrote her off. I liked how they acknowledged her with a couple of sentences. and Yeah, I thought that worked out well. Perfect. Um, general thoughts, Scotty? Shockingly enough, after the shit that I gave Scream 5, I really, really, really dumped this one. Um, it it does what a sequel should do. It ramps up the gore while keeping a similar style to it. Does something a little different with the motivation, which I will keep uh, for when we do the review later. Um, the only thing, just like most Scream movies is the reveals at the end were eye-rolling. And there were some cheesy moments, but this one was kind of more of a go-for-the-throat style screen movie, and I, I got applauded for that. I had fun with it. I think the biggest thing I will say to this is I think they did a really good job of leaving legacy characters behind and moving forward with establishing these characters. Um, it felt very similar to Scream 2. Yes. Um, even the motivation for the killers felt very similar. Um, if you recall who the killer was, obviously. We'll talk about that more in spoiler. Um, but yeah, it was good. It was a good movie. And yeah, like, I, and what I, are I the better say, Scream like, films? Right. Yes. Um, I completely agree. I think this is like my, tied for my second favorite now, because Scream 2 was my second favorite. And I think this is time for it now. And I think um, if they continue on to, let's say, the third one mimics Scream 3, um, even though I enjoy Scream 3, this could be the chance for them to get it right. 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 Yeah, and uh, I do have to say, too, I love how they utilized the New York setting. Yeah, I thought they did a pretty good job of using their budget. Like, there's, we'll talk about it in spoilers. There's some ridiculous scenes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but, like, it's a fucking Scream film. You know what I mean? Like, I don't expect much in Scream films, to be quite honest with you. They're they're kind of just there. Um, but we will yeah. get to that. And I will say also, uh, this one kind of uh, added something to Scream 5 to a certain character from Scream 5 that makes me appreciate the motivations a little more from the last one. Yes, I would agree. I would agree. Um... Finally, well, well, final two that we'll talk about is Children of the Corn. Yeah. Scotty and I managed to see the soon-to-be, I guess, what would you call this? Remake? Readaptation? Um, yeah, I would say this is a remake. Um, I believe it's currently available to rent. Shutter will be picking it up soon. Uh, or will be on Shutter eventually. It is a 92-minute runtime. This movie was made in 2020, but it was shelved. Um, at least over here in North America, we're just getting it now, right? So 
Possessed by a spirit in the dying cornfield, a 12-year-old girl in Nebraska recruits the other children in her small town to go on a bloody rampage and kills all the adults and anyone who opposes her. So thoughts, Scotty? Um, all right. So I heard a lot of people shitting on this. For one, I ignored what people were saying because I'm like, yep, y'all are shitting on it because it's a remake. I guarantee it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you all right now. I'm not the biggest fan of the first Children of the Corn. Oh, I like, so fucking like, boring. Yeah, I like the first quarter to first third of the film. But once the uh, strangers show up in Nebraska, like after their car breaks down, then the film just gets kind of boring to me and then picks up a little in the final act. This film, though, I like what they did. They, uh, I, they ended up going with the whole children killing off all the adults in the town and focusing on that as the main plot where in the original film, the, all the adults are killed off within like the first 10 minutes of the film. And they kind of do a boring-ish mm-hmm. story after. Mm-hmm. I liked how they made that the main focus for this story. Um, there is no Isaac or Malachi, so I can see why like fans of that film, of the original, would be upset. Instead, you have Eden, who is kind of taking the role of both. Well, and, and, and the brother of the main protagonist, kind of. Kind of. like he, Yeah. He doesn't have a big part like Isaac or Malachi did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's there. He's kind of there and has a little bit, but it's like they could have used him, utilized him more, I think. Agreed. Agreed. But um, all in all, I thought this was decent. It wasn't terrible. I Like, of all the Children of the Corn movies, it's right up there with the original for me because I find all the Children of the Corn movies pretty damn bad, like the ones I've seen. Um, but uh, the only one, one of the biggest things I complained about is they almost tried to do a sympathetic side to the killer children by making the adults all fucking assholes to all the kids, like, constantly. Like, they were just all, like, grown-up fucking bullies. Yeah, which was weird. Like, yeah. a group of, like, I don't know. I, honestly, my issue with this movie was that I felt like it got choppy and it didn't know what it wanted to be. Yes. Like, there was some moves made. Like, this was a movie that maybe we'll do a spoiler of at some point. Because there was some moves made by some of the characters in this that I was like, what the fuck? Right. Like, why would you do that? Like, I feel as though this movie must have suffered from studio interference because it had the makings to be pretty good. Yeah. Like the premise at the beginning was pretty good. Um the setup to what was going to it was it was kind of the second and third act where I was like what the fuck? Yeah. And like a lot of deleted kills, like a lot of like aftermath you see shit yeah. happen and like I don't know, it was very now, the main character, the main young lady who played um, Eden, which is Katie Moyer, I liked her quite a bit. She was in It. Um, she was actually quite a good young actress. I look forward to seeing her. Now, she's also Canadian. Um, she's won Canadian Screen Awards as well. I do think she has some talent. Um, I hope to see her in other stuff. But I just feel like this movie suffered from somebody somewhere people weren't getting along and i don't know exactly what happened but it made it very disjointed even the last clip of it what the fuck yeah what the fuck well the last clip kind of sort of ties into what happens to malachi at the end kind of kind of but not really yeah i don't know it's just just weird it was was weird yeah i will say i like the idea of uh their version of he who walks behind the rose i like yes I thought that was interesting. CGI was a bit iffy, but I, you know, I could give a rat's ass less on how the CGI looks most of the time. But I liked that concept. But they didn't do that concept as well. Like, it, it so was disjointed with everything else. Yeah. You know? And even, like, oh, my gosh. Maybe we should add this to spoilers at the end. It hasn't been released yeah. yet, though. Maybe we could talk about it briefly. Because, like, I feel like we got two really good movies to talk about. Well... I don't know. Like, I think Children of the Corn, if we do talk about it, we'll talk about it some other time because it was just, it had such potential. Maybe yeah. once more people watch it and it gets dropped on Shutter, we'll revisit it. Maybe that's an idea for later on and see what people are start saying about it. And then we'll do a spoiler on it. Yeah, I'd be down about that. Yeah, because, like, it's just, I don't know. Like, this movie, I was like, mmm. 
It could have been so much better. What it, kind of like how I felt here, about right? the Outwaters. It's like, oh, yeah. there's potential here. Yeah, this could have been a lot better, but something somewhere there was some kind of interference, or it must have been. Yeah. Uh, people couldn't figure out what they wanted done. So, anyway, the final movie we're going to talk about is the most recent drop on Shutter as of the recording today, which is the first weekend of April. Um, the Unheard. This yeah, is a hundred. Sorry, this is what I haven't seen yet. I didn't think so because it just dropped Friday, and I watched it. I don't think you had a chance to watch it. No, not yet. Um, this is a hundred and twenty-four minute runtime, and let me tell you. It feels like a 124-minute runtime. Uh, Chloe Graydon undergoes an experimental procedure to restore her hearing. Soon she begins to suffer from auditory hallucinations related to the disappearance of her mother. Um, She's deaf. She can't hear. She eventually is able to hear, figures out the disappearance of her mother. Uh, this is not a new concept. This is a okay movie. But yet again, if you have seen any movie like this before... You're going to know what's going to happen throughout the entire thing. Oh, boy. You're going to be like, yep, that was the antagonist. Yep, that's what that person did. Yep, that makes sense. Yep, there's the red herring. And the worst part is you'll know it's the red herring before they tell you it's a red herring. Of course. Uh, That being said, I thought the young lady was great in it. I thought the dialogue was good. I was entertained enough by it. And because we watch all the Shudder movies... I would say it was fine. I don't think it stands out as one of the must watch for Shudder this year. Anywhere. I don't think anyone's going to talk about it besides us because we wa- and Mark Nato because we watch all the Shudder films. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's about it. So, you know, if the premise sounds like it would be of interest to you, you could check it out on Shudder or AMC. Um, but I don't think you're going to have this in your top 10 of the year. Good to know. It reminds me of Slapface. Like, okay. how we watched that, it was okay, but no one talked about Slapface. Right. Gotcha. Right. Um, I feel like this is going to go down the same road. Okay. Good to know. I'll watch it just because it's Shudder, but, yeah. Well, and that's our job as podcasters that watch everything, Scotty. Oh, I know. So... I don't have it on here. I'm actually going to take the one off of here, and I'm going to talk about the two movies briefly that I watched on St. Patrick's Day. Um, So I watched Leprechaun in the Hood on St. Patrick's Day, and I thought it was fucking hilarious. Scott was like, I can't believe you like that film. And I'm like, I don't know, man. It's really fucking funny. Like, it's just... In the Hood or Back to the Hood? In the Hood, the first one. Okay. That one, yeah. I did... I think I was getting... I am getting them confused, but I think I thought In the Hood was okay. (laughs) Like Ice T's in it, and who else was in it? Um, there's another rapper I'm pretty sure that makes a cameo for like 50 seconds. Oh, Coolio, <laughs> Coolio's in it. Um, it's it's silly. Like what a fucking silly Leprechaun movie. This was a series that just went bonkers off the wall, and In the Hood was just part of that. I did enjoy how there was a group of um three gentlemen um who identified I assume as black. That were trying to kind of just make it in the music industry, but they didn't throw them as gangbangers, which was nice to see. Like, right. educated young men spoke educated. Like, it was nice to see that as opposed to all that other stereotype, especially in 2000s. Um, and I don't know who made this movie. If the director was a person of color. Let me see here. Director was white. Anyway. Hmm. Um, and the writer was white. And he was the same producer. But yeah, it was just... <laughs> It was just really, really silly. So I did enjoy it for what it was in 2000s. And then I watched Leprechaun Origins. And Scott was like, oh, Heather, don't watch it. It's so bad. Everyone says it's so bad. Okay, like, I'm going to put this out here. I don't get why people hate this movie. Is it because there wasn't a smart-ass talking Leprechaun? Like, is everyone that invested in the in Warren, Warwick Davis that they can't handle another version of Leprechauns? Because this was actually more accurate to the legend than anything else to be honest with you so i didn't think this movie was shitty at all i enjoyed it i don't get the 1.2 rating on letterbox rob humphreys i don't get your one and a half star rating on letterbox <laughs> like i don't know man this was like a creature feature of like an hour and a half and not bad kills i didn't get what the problem was these were angry goblin like replicons which i don't know according to irish folklore we've watched a lot of irish folklore stuff and let me tell you they're not wisecracking they're not like, right. mighty, mighty, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, that's just a stereotype of stuff, which is fine. This seemed more legends to me. And I don't know. I enjoyed the flow of the movie. I even rewind parts of it so I could make sure I could follow along with what was happening <laughs> in terms of this couple getting away. 
I'm not going to sit here and say that it's the best Leprechaun movie to come around, but I just looked at it as a creature feature that was doing something different, and I couldn't even tell that the WWE guy was in it. He didn't talk. Yeah. He was in so much fucking makeup. He was just a creature. Yeah, I was going to say, because I know he was just fully prosthetic creature. Yeah, like, I thought it was great. I, I honestly, Scott, you'll watch this movie, I know you, and you'll be like, why is everyone shitting on this movie? Like, guaranteed. Yeah, I would put I fucking money that. on it. <clears throat> Like, I don't think you're going to walk out of it. Like, neither one of us will ever walk out of it and be like, oh, man, best, best movie ever. Right. But, like, it's not as bad as people say it is. Unless you go in there thinking they're going to get wisecracking, top of the morning to you, <laughs> raining for 15 hours. Like, <laughs> Leprechaun, if you just want some creepy-ass fucking scary little things like monsters that are chasing you around and fucking shit up and... People are bleeding all over the place and slicing them open, and you got some, like, locals that are, like, basically fucking sacrificing tourists to them. Ah! Not a bad film. I don't know why people shit on this. I think most people should give it a rewatch and just, like, separate it. Like, I, how can In the Hood be that much better than this film? That's what I don't get. This isn't that bad. I really want yeah, you to I, watch it. I really do. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can find it at some point, because, yeah, like... And, you know like, what I might do? I might ask a good friend of ours to upload it on their Plex so you can watch it. And maybe you and Erica can watch it sometime when she comes over. Okay, well, I'll check. Where is it on Letterboxd? Do you have Letterboxd open right now? Yeah, it says that it's available on Amazon and Netflix. And it says Netflix across the board. Hmm. Actually, because yeah, I checked and it wasn't for me. That's right. Let me see. Maybe it's on Tubi? Well, I'm looking right now. It's uh, Voodoo, Amazon, Google, iTunes. Yep. So, to rent. Well, let me see if I can get, because honestly, it's not, <clears throat> I don't know. Everyone talks about it like it's a big pile of shit. I have seen way worse movies than this. Uh, I'm sure way worse. Ones, I'm sure a couple of the ones I brought up earlier are way worse. Yeah, like I, this was just a fucking fun little creature feature of leprechauns supposed to be these evil monsters things that chase you. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Enough. Nothing, well, nothing super special, but nothing. Yeah. Don't, don't buy the hype. Like, Dave Bailey gave it three stars. And you know what, Dave Bailey? I agree with you. Dave Bailey knows what the fucking deal is. That is not, and this is not a bad movie. People just shit on it because it's not like the other one. Rob's all like, oh, I'm so bad now. He is a leprechaun. <laughs> that's why. Maybe that represented what Rob does with his spare time, and that's why he was upset. But anyway, those two I watched on St. Paddy's Day before I went out and got drunk, and that was a lot of fun. So, nice. and I'll bring up the other one I was going to bring up next time. But you, why don't you tell me about yours? All right, so... uh you know, this is where I seem to be doing a lot of my older watches right now is on the To Be Tuesday date night with Erica. We just kind of, you know, pick random movies. Uh, oh, you have a girlfriend? I do. I don't think I talked about her enough yet. Oh, it's well weird. You never bring it up. Ever. No, not at all. Neither do you. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. You bring it up all the time. I'm scarred by it. I just oh. worried that Erica won't like me. Uh, well, I don't know what lies you've been feeding her about me. Oh, terrible lies. Terrible, nice. terrible, terrible. Nice. But uh, she chose this one, and it was called The Domestics from 2018. Oh, did it I sum assume... up what she was going to do to you when she was coming to see you that weekend? <laughs> <laughs> yes. But uh, what intrigued me, though, like, when I looked it up, was Venom gave this four out of five stars. What? From Mr. Venom from Fresh Cuts. So I was like, ooh, okay. So we started watching it. Uh, the synopsis, or the tagline, in the end, defend. The synopsis is a young husband and wife must fight must fight to return home in a post-apocalyptic Midwestern landscape ravaged by gangs. This is where post-apocalyptic the setting actually worked for me. Um, this felt almost like a, a horror version of like Mad Max. Cool. Like it's a husband and wife. They're trying to get back to see her mother because uh, and she lives all the way out and. I want to say Missouri, I can't remember exactly, but, uh, you know, hundreds of miles away, or hundreds of thousands of miles away or whatever. And uh, the only reason they're going out there is because they had not heard from her mother. They would talk on the phone all the time or, like, you know, communicate with each other, and all of a sudden, communication just stopped. Mm. And she she was extremely worried and needed to get out there to find out what happened to them, to her and her dad. Yeah. And uh, so they take a chance by getting in their car and start heading to the to the state where their mom and dad live. And there are several different types of gangs that basically run this world now. Like, if you're caught on the street, you could run into, like, all sort, sorts of different members of these gangs. And each gang holds different territories. And, of course, these gangs are 
warring with each other as well as fucking with anybody that they just see that are innocent. Sounds like Canada geese. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> um, but man, um, this movie had some very tense moments and just some fucked up, uh, fucked up villains of gang members. And it was gory. It was just a lot of fun. It was like pretty much go, go, go from the get go. It wasn't the real low, not a lot of downtime. Nice. Um, my biggest complaints is the woman. Uh, what is her name? She's well known. And I think she was in one of the movies we recently watched uh, last year. Yeah, Kate Bosworth. She played the uh, wife. And the only complaint I had about was how her character was. Her acting was great. But some of the decisions her character made was just like, really? Okay, a little unbelievable, but okay. Um, Mm. And, like, she gets wounded at one point, but then it just seems like that wound doesn't matter. Like, she gets shot in the shoulder, then all of a sudden she's shooting a gun like a couple of days later and like <laughs> it's recoiling and everything i'm going yeah you would be feeling pain from that but she's just no, like she's american like, no yeah she's like an american badass basically yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that's like my only thing where i was like really but everything else in this i thought was excellent it was really fast-paced it was gory just had some tense moments a really cool like really cool horror road movie nice that, I definitely recommend, and it is on Tubi. Awesome. And did Erica enjoy it as well? Yep, she really enjoyed it too. Like she had the same complaints I did about like Kate Bosworth. Well, this sounds like you two are two negative Nellies about Kate Bosworth, huh? <laughs> hey, I like her as an actress. Uh. I think she was the one that uh, played the opposite end of uh, Justin Long in that Darkness movie. Yes, he did. Yeah, and they're a cute couple too. Do you follow him on Instagram at all? No. Oh, are they so together? I've, yeah, they're they're a real life couple. Oh shit. I yeah, expect. and um, you know, in uh, oh my gosh, the one that you really liked last year, that was filmed in Michigan, Detroit, about the houses, and the underground. Oh, 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 barbarian. Yeah, so you know when the agent calls and it's the guy and the girl talking to Justin Lawn. Yeah. It's Kate Bosworth. Really. Yeah, 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 and That's like. Cool. And I've been following him on Instagram because I'm like, there's no way he like he plays such a like rapist shitty dude. He there's no way this. A woman like Kate Bothworth would probably be with a guy like that. You know what I mean? If that's truly what he's like. And so I've been following him on Instagram. He's a pretty, like, active political person and pretty outspoken about, oh, yeah, he's, like, I would definitely say liberal. (laughs) Very liberal. Um, Yeah, he's a pretty, like, he seems like actually a really nice guy. Nice. Which makes sense because always the assholes end up, like, the ones that play the assholes always end up being the nicest people. Exactly. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, it's he's an in, it follows Instagram. He's uh he's pretty funny. So all right, where are we? I oh, what's new? So oh, no, no, I, what, what's new with you? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. So I started watching recently Unsolved Mysteries on Netflix. The new Unsolved Mysteries. And this is pretty cool. So there's three volumes of it right now, and they have a variety of different stuff from did someone commit suicide or was it murder? This person went missing in a boat and has never been found again. You know, some ghost stuff, some uh, alien related stuff, which I and all the shows are about 45 minutes in length and there's no narrator. So there's no one that really narrates it. They just present the stories, told documentation, documentary style. And then at the end, it gives you a chance to be like, are you aware of any of these people? There's a couple with abductions, parents that have abducted children. Or grandparents that abducted children, and it kind of goes through and, and shows you what they would look like now. And I always watch for that stuff because you never know, right? If you right. can make a difference, if you see something or you see whatever. But yeah, it's a good little series on Netflix. I do think it's horror adjacent. So if you enjoyed the original Unsolved Mysteries, this definitely has more money and quality put into it. And it's filmed more like a documentary that you would see, like a crime documentary from, you know, the 20, like from now, from present day, right? Um, yeah, recommend it. It's on Netflix. Check it out. Nice. Yeah, I was, because uh, uh, I've been curious about that. Like, I've I've I always liked the Unsolved Mysteries. So yeah, I'll, I'll check this out. Um for my what's new, I almost went because I was struggling to think of like what I did that was horror adjacent or like something that I was into, and I almost dove into uh, Match of the Gathering's new set, March of the Machines, and it's uh, more for that because they've been releasing little stories to kind of tie into what's mm-hmm. going on in the card game. 
and definitely horror adjacent. But I was like, I'm not gonna bore people with my nerdiness this time around because I would be I'd probably go on for way too long about it. You're but, like, uh, not today, Satan, not today. So I chose another movie that uh, Erica and I ended up watching a couple weeks back on a Saturday Saturday called Heavy Trip. This is a uh, I would say kind of like a black comedy. It's mm. not horror comedy at all, but uh, uh, oh, okay. I was trying to think like uh, um, this uh, tagline was weird, but uh, the tagline is better shit thighs than eternal constipation. I don't know, I don't get it, but uh, it, this is a uh, Swedish film or Norwegian film, if I remember correctly. But uh, the synopsis is: Turo is stuck in a small village, and the best thing in his life is being the lead vocalist for the amateur metal band Impaled Rectum. He and his bandmates, <laughs> right? <laughs> he and his bandmates have practiced for 12 years without playing a single gig. The guys get a surprise visitor from Norway, the promoter for a huge heavy metal music festival, and decide it's now or never. They steal a van, a corpse, and even a new drummer to make their dreams a reality. And this is totally like a uh, black metal along the lines of like that Lords of uh, Lords of Chaos film, like a band like that. Nice. But uh, this is definitely more comedic and the reason i chose is just because you know the black metal kind of fits along with the horror theme so they're like all about like just basically a fun road movie like just super hilarious uh the band members are all different types of personality one is like a musical knowledge uh, a band knowledge library he like can tell you everything about each band and what each band music meant and what they were trying to do and this and that and like he goes into like nerdy detailed lengths and he's just like this very straight-faced character that he shows up in corpse paint and all this shit for the shows but no one else does and he goes to events and he's in corpse paint and like it's just silly it's fun uh and just yeah all around this is an amazing time if you're a fan of like those like uh i would like comedic road movies I would add this to your list because um, it is funny as shit and it's got some blood and guts here, but it's like not like horror. It's just like random weird stuff. But man, I had so much fun with this. And I know Erica did too because she's seen the trailer and she goes, oh my God, this is right up your alley. So I watched the trailer and I'm going, oh, this is amazing. So one person I think I would recommend this to is Tim Davis just because I think he would have a kick out of it being about this black metal band and shit like that. It kind of gives me, like, Deathgasm vibes without the horror. Like, where they're coming up with different names for their metal band and shit like that. Well, it's... already the name of the band sounds like something he would think is hilarious. Right, Impaled Rectum. Honestly. <laughs> so, where did you watch it? Was it Tubi as well? Yep, this was free on nice, Tubi. Nice, Tubi, man. So many, like, hidden gems that you can just find, oh, huh? absolutely. Right? Like, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome how that can occur. So... I guess we'll move on to our Out of the Dark, which is where we're going to do some spoiler discussion of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, and Scream 6. So if for some, re for some reason you haven't seen these movies, we totally understand if you want to leave us now. Um, but we will be discussing both of them in terms of just what we liked, what we didn't like. Uh, spoiler, I liked both, and I thought both were a lot of fucking fun. And I don't know. Both are very different when it comes to budget as well, which I think is an interesting discussion. Uh, one had a string, string, shoestring budget, and the other one obviously was filmed in New York City, so it had a lot more fucking money. It's a Scream franchise. But why don't we start with Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey? Um, so I saw this one before Scotty did. I saw it back in February, but I can still clearly remember it. I thought the opening scene of like how Christopher Robbins kind of finds these creatures that are kind of living that are half man, half creature in the forest feeds them, but then they starve. And I don't know how you felt. I felt really depressed when I found out that they were starving to death. Did it like hit your feels? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm like, well, shit, I didn't expect it to go this dark. And right? Like, and I love how they told that, like, just kind of gave you a synopsis of how they became ferocious and, yeah. like, gave an excuse of why they don't talk anymore. Like, and yeah. the fact that they just went back to their feral state after Christopher Robin was le left them behind. And uh, I was like, 
like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And then how they ended up, like they were starving to death and they ended up resorting to eating Eeyore and cannibalizing. And when they did that, it turned them back to their animalistic ways, which right? was a very cool like setup for the story. I'm like, okay, movie, I am into this. What's going on? Like, and I, I guess because Eeyore was like the most skinny and like the weakest, that's why they chose him. And it was Pooh, Piglet, Rabbit, and Owl. So you only see Pooh and Piglet. You don't see yes. Rabbit and Owl in this movie. There's no talk of Kanga or Roo. And, or Tigger. And I kind of, or Tigger. And I was kind of depressed that Eeyore was gone. I thought that kind of sucked because I like Eeyore. Um, but it's done in, in drawing. And I thought the animation was actually really, really good. Yeah, it was kind of creepy. Right? And then so Christopher Robin comes back and he's with his like fucking fiance. And she's like... Maybe they didn't exist. Maybe you're just hallucinating. <laughs> anyway, he finds them and they're all like fucking pissed. That, and they make him show. They show him Eeyore's remains or his grave, right? To be like, mm-hmm. we had to eat him. And and then it flashes to these university students and like, there's some random like fucking kills with with Pooh chasing someone into a wood chipper area and then like <laughs> Piglet with the hot the hot tub chick. Yes. I jumped around the corner and the theater I saw with a group of people and we were fucking dying laughing. It was so funny. Um, and then, and then Winnie the Pooh lert, apparently knows how to drive right? and fucking runs over that chick's head and like crushes it in this like slow motion effect, which looked silly but awesome at the same time. <laughs> right. It was so fucking funny. And I just like... <laughs> I I I don't know. So I've heard some criticism on this film. First of all, someone has been like, "Oh, you know, it's you know, it's it's cheesy. You can tell it's a guy that's in a mask." And my response to that is, "Did you think they were going to bring Pooh and Piglet to life? Right in CGI <laughs> in a budget of under a hundred thousand dollars? Did you not watch the trailer or see did any you, of the stills? Uh, did you not understand this is a low budget slasher? I'm I'm kind of concerned about your grasp on reality. If you're concerned that it was a man in a rubber mask, who who else did you think it was going to be? Right. Um. I I did think the scenes of where he would throw honey onto his face. <laughs> it would like drip down. Was hilarious. It looked so gross too, but right? it was hilarious the way they did that. Um, like my only real complaint with this was just uh, all the girls from that sorority or whatever that show up are all interchangeable, and I didn't know which. Oh one yeah, was. like they were just there for kill count, right? Yeah, and that was fine. To me, the third act picks up. I know Tim didn't think this had good effects. I don't know. Maybe I saw it in the theater. And it was a better watching experience because when I saw her head get fucking smashed by the fucking car wheel, I was like, fuck yeah. Like, I don't yeah, know how that, that isn't a good gore and good practical effects, but. Yeah, I thought they, they had some pretty cool kills. Like yeah. Fun kills, and yeah, they were pretty good effects, especially for something low budget. Right. And like, I, I liked when <laughs> the four local men try to beat up Winnie the Pooh and he fucking kicks their ass. Oh, like, yeah. It's fucking hilarious. And I and like, like that they turned that around because you're like, oh, some weird hick locals are going to, like, harass yeah. these women. And no, they end up sticking up for them and defending them. I was going, oh, good job, movie. I expect them to be, like, some weird fucking people that Pooh would just kill just because they were in his way. But no, like, they right? actually were trying to defend them. Right? And they're torturing a Christopher Robin fucking made me laugh. And he's like, Pooh, I'm sorry. And, like, <laughs> and when Pooh would look in the mirror and think about hearing Christopher Robin's voice being like, I'll never leave you. And, you know, obviously these are fictional characters, okay? But when you think about, they wouldn't have the development to, develop, developed ability to understand that they left. Um, and I, I, I think that that would be a really valid point on how someone would feel like if they had the the comprehension of let's say a three-year-old and they left and then you starved and you had to eat your friend to survive you know it's not a bad setup for hating christopher robin and humanity right and i think what stood out to me in this movie was the fucking ending so he has the final the final girl the girl has actually done a lot right considering throughout this situation she's run when she's needed to run she's fought when she's needed to fight 
and she's there. She's obviously trying to get past some trauma. We have her session with the therapist earlier. You kind of build some kind of connection to her. And and Christopher Robbins is begging. You know, she's managed to save Christopher Robbins. And he's like, please, please, like, I will stay. I will stay forever here. And Pooh lowers his knife. And then he goes, you left. And he slices her fucking throat open. I could have done a fucking standing ovation right there in the theater. That scene, I don't care, Tim Davis, if you didn't fucking like it, you're wrong. Because yeah. that scene was fucking mint. Fucking yeah mint that's how you end a horror movie and he runs off and we're gonna get a fucking sequel and everyone who didn't like this movie don't waste my time by watching the sequel no one cares about your opinion this is gonna be a fun fucking movie because he's gonna have more money so i can't imagine what other shenanigans he's gonna get up to this time around yeah i'm looking forward to it because yeah like i went into this expecting to just be like all right this is gonna be dumb and silly and Mm -hmm. it was dumb and silly because of the concept but it still was darker than i expected as well right it was a lot darker a lot darker and i'm uh I don't know. I liked it a lot. I knew going into it what it was going to be. I knew it was going to be a little bunch of slasher. My expectations were set. Uh, do I think it's the best movie of the year? Of course not. Of course not. But yeah. Do I think it was a lot of fucking fun? Fuck yeah, I did. And yeah. I look forward to the sequel. I think it's going to be also a lot of fucking fun. And I just, I don't know, that line um, on when the knife went across his fucking throat and I was just like, Or her throat, I was like, fuck, that was a good... Because he had taken, like, would never speak again. And that one line was actually really tied into his pain and anguish that he felt throughout the movie. I thought it was really good. It all connected nicely. So for people who didn't like it, Rob Humphrey right now is giving me the biggest high five because I know he (laughs) fucking loved this movie. Yeah. And Tim's like... Well, it, it was just like Jaws because, you know, when it poos like Jaws and he's trying to figure out how to do a comparison to Jaws. So <laughs> just kidding, Tim. I know you didn't hate this movie. I know you liked it, but you constantly make fun of me all the time except for the most recent episode. Finally, Scott got something instead of me getting it all the time. Yeah, that was hilarious. <laughs> right? You are a traitor. At least, at least I'm honest with Tim. Hey, I was honest with him, too. He's still my side piece, bitch. Um, I think he thought he was main piece. Well, I mean, if if, I, if he was my main piece, then that means I was his side bitch, because his main piece is Jaleesa. Well, maybe that's not how it really is. So you maybe he's going to pull a Winnie the Pooh on you one day, and he's going to have me with a knife to my throat, and you're going to be like, no, please, don't don't kill Heather. Friday Nightmares. No, no, not Heather. She she's the only one that like Scream Three. No, no. And he's gonna be like, you laugh. That he's gonna <laughs> slice me open. I'm sorry. And then it's gonna be all your fault. Just I so apologize. you know. I apologize now. I'm sorry. And he's gonna be wearing a drop bear mask. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anything you want to add about Winnie the Pooh besides like fun times? No, I, that that I think we covered it up. I mean, it's very simple. There isn't a lot to talk about. Like, cause no. it's just basic slasher in that aspect. It's just it was fun. Paint by numbers. Paint by numbers, right? Yeah. Um, what about Scream 6? Okay. So, uh, well, right off the bat, I have to say, that opening fucking scene, wow, beautiful. Mm-hmm. That, because mm-hmm. to kind of lay it out, since we are doing spoiler reviews here, like, you know, it starts off with Samara weaving in the bar, tra- getting yep. ready to meet somebody that's on, a, like, a dating app, and... The phone rings because he says he's lost and everything like that. And you find out she's a professor at a college that teaches slasher films, like history of slasher films. Like, man, I want to go to that class. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but they end up convincing her to come outside because they they can't find the building. She goes out gets and gets killed and gets killed in a pretty gory way. And I'm like, oh, no, not Samara Weaving. I like her. But uh, <laughs> um. But then the killer takes off his mask, and I'm going, what? They're revealing him already? What the fuck? And then it goes to his apartment, and you see he's just an obsessed fan of Stab, because, you know, that's the typical way these films go. Um, And then he gets killed by Ghostface. I'm like, what the fuck? (laughs) <laughs> what is going on? I know, wasn't that the best opening? I was like, and this is how you make something different. 
Yeah. Because Scream but... 5 opening was not different besides the fact that General Otega didn't die. You know what I mean? Oh, can right. you hear me still? Yeah. Oh, sorry. There was a delay. And this will be awkward yeah, when you listen you back. Me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now I can. Okay. But uh, yeah, like I thought this was a unique take for an opening to a Scream film. And yeah, pretty goddamn violent with the uh, cut up friend or boyfriend in the fridge. Mm-hmm. Kind of gave me uh gave me Friday the Thirteenth Part Two vibes with uh mm-hmm. Jason Voorhees' mom's head in the fridge. I agree. Um, and then yeah, like then it kind of pans back over to the two main characters from Part Five and the couple of survivors, which I was a little confused because I did not realize the brother of uh, Randy's children survived. Like I thought he got killed in Part Five, but he did get killed off screen so maybe he was just stabbed and left uh yeah didn't you remember he got drawn like they were both the twins were in stretchers at the end oh that's right okay uh but yeah so you get the, like the whole uh them talking about like them, them being basically randy and talking about like what legacy mm-hmm. sequels mean and how no one is safe and all this shit and uh like one of the sisters is the older sister is trying to deal with her trauma by going to a therapist but not really talking about anything so she's not really dealing with anything and like the most unprofessional therapist though ever like some of this stuff in this movie was so silly no therapist would act like that right like oh i can't work with you anymore now oh no <laughs> right like, office, i was like oh get the fuck out of here the yes fuck out of here. some of that was very silly but uh like right. i like how it ties into like her getting constantly bullied and shit talked because uh, they find out she was Billy Loomis's daughter and that they started spreading rumors that she was the one that killed all of her friends in the last film and stuff like that. So it kind of makes this takes this path of oh, is she gonna be the killer then? Is like did all this finally snap and Billy Loomis uh, kind of come out of her a bit because you know she did go crazy and stab the her boyfriend twenty six or so times mm-hmm. in the last movie. And it kind of plays on that for a while, which I thought was pretty cool because it's like trauma, but then also kind of a good, a good red herring for that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I, and I do have to say, the, the spirit of Billy Loomis coming back as just like visions of her unstable mind as she is dealing with everything plays out so much better in this than it did in the last film. Where in the last film, it almost felt forced to have him in there and i agree where i agree this was a little more natural yeah like i felt like you know like she, just a voice in her head kind of which made more sense and uh i also do have to give props to the writers of this film for apparently listening to people's uh thoughts on Stu mocker is not actually dead and he's still alive after the events of scream one because Randy's uh, daughter brings up, like, yep, some people seem to believe Stu Mocker is still alive. I don't know if he is or not, but people still believe that. I'm going, ha, ah, that's kind of nice nod to them, like, listening to people talk about their weird uh, theories on the films. Right, right. And I think that the tribute to everything was was good. Like, I thought the tribute stuff with the costumes and all the, all the um props and stuff was really really cool yes the things i didn't like about this movie they get randomly attacked in the street and run into a convenience store and they're not these this guy these killers kill these random other people that are in the convenience store like it was a cool scene don't get me wrong but it seemed absolutely ridiculous because in the other scream movies the scream killer only targets the people that they want to kill they don't just kill randoms and i think I think that I kind of like that because it goes to show that, all right, this killer does not give a flying fuck. I guess, right? But I just, I don't know. To me, it was silly. To me, it was silly. Um, I, I did... I did find the rant about the film stuff entertaining, but I could see how that would get it on people's nerves. You know, when she's like going off in the park about this and that and the other thing and yeah, how everything really comes together. I, I just take that as uh, that's just part of the Scream franchise. That's in every film. Yeah, yeah, it is. You're right. A hundred percent. But I did think that Kirby being in it, I thought that was really cool because um, you do never see her die. It right. is true. She, she never do get the confirmation that she died. Um, and I did think that the cop was one of the worst actors that I've ever seen. Um, and you kind of knew it was him the moment that he's like, oh, I saw my daughter. I 
they took me off the case and like he kind of like helps them and they're like all of a sudden the mystery machine gang trying to figure out what's going on i did enjoy the the, the chase scene with gail to me that was a highlight yes right and like I felt like she finally where Sydney always got to outsmart the killer. Like Gil had a couple of scenes where she did in some of the movies, but this was one that really stood out. And I thought she did a really fucking good job. Like when she does the call back, I thought that was really, that was, yeah. And it made me laugh because she's like, Oh, hold on a second. He's like, what, what? And she hangs up on him. I was like, that is fucking hilarious. Yeah. It was awesome. (laughs) It was awesome. Um, The reveal was where I feel like it was like, Oh really? Like you kind of thought it was that, but like, it was like, I don't know. Like, and then it ties back into the boyfriend. And you're like, uh, here we go. <laughs> right? yeah, I was going to say the reveal, like I didn't, I thought the dad could have been the, the cop could have been the killer. But at the same time, I started second guessing myself because I'm like, well, maybe it is Kirby. And then I'm like, well, maybe it's both of them. Oh, no. The yeah. Cop seems to be more helping them. Okay. I don't think it's him. I do think it's the other less uh, notable sidekick character that was with the group, though. I was like, the yeah. one that kept getting called Ghostface or whatever. I was like, yeah, he's but definitely. But why did one. why didn't he kill the twin? Like he stabbed he, her twice, but he didn't kill her. Oh, uh, or he or his sister did. Yeah, I think his sister kill, uh, did, but I think uh, I think she thought she killed her. Oh, okay. Or they were trying to like kind of like build up more uh, blame on who it could be or something. I think they're setting the seeds for the next one for her to be a killer. Oh, that could be. Like, she comes up with something of, like, everyone's tried to do this and none of them have got it right, so I'm going to get it right. Right. That right? could be. Um, um, and that, uh, that like, I don't know. Scream is always unbelievable. Always unbelievable. And this was also unbelievable. But it was entertaining. Yeah, and, I, and the one thing I kind of brought up when we first talked about it in our What We Watch <laughs> segment, uh, you know, it kind of ties into the re- whole reveal. But when they go to that... Uh, museum of everything from like what actually like you know in our in our eyes what happened in all the other sequels like the props and all that stuff but it's like you know real life shit that happened to these characters um and how it was like this museum to Ghostface and all the victims he killed like throughout the different killers and showing that this was the main character's boyfriend the killer from the fifth film this was his museum his obsession where i was going Mm -hmm. okay his obsession like his motivation now makes a little more sense to me i like this because it shows he was not only obsessed with the stab movies but he was obsessed with the real life murders as well collecting evidence and shit like that that no one else should be able to get like someone that's gone a little too obsessive with like collecting shit from ted bundy type shit right i'm like right okay so it's not just movies to that guy it was real life shit too he was obsessed with everything right and i was like okay right. that makes the killer in part five a little more motivational then like, i i get that like it actually kind of brings up scream five a little bit for me because of that yeah the tie-in was pretty good right and yeah i again you know scream has a bunch of unrealistic shit that happens in every single film Every single film is over the top and silly. Every single film. And this one was no exception to that rule. It also had a lot of really weird shit and silly things that happen. Um, The one scene I really did enjoy was the ladder scene where she had the crawl across the ladder. They both did trying to get away. I thought that was really well done and suspenseful. Um, The body count wasn't as high in this one as that. You count those random people in the convenience store that they just fucking killed off for no reason. Um... Yeah, I I am interested. I don't think what's her face, the main chick, is going to do a heel turn and end up being the scream killer. I think it's going to be one of the twins. I think it's going to be that chick, and I think she's going to go crazy. She's lost her girlfriend, and you know she was almost stabbed twice. Nothing really seems to happen to her, and I think she's going to be part of it. I do. Yeah, but I was going to say, her brother is basically the new Dewey who's just going to get hurt in every single movie. Yeah, yeah, right, with Jenna Ortega. And I did enjoy Jenna Ortega. I think she's kind of the standout, to be honest with you, in the yeah. act shops. Um, even though her character isn't super deep here, I do think she plays it well. Um, yeah, I mean, interesting. I, I will say I went in with low expectations, so I left with enjoying the film. Yeah, same. Like, I didn't expect it to be nearly as enjoyable as I thought it was by the time I left. I was like, that was mm-hmm. fun. And, yeah, like, ramped up the gore, which I'm always a fan of, and, like, Especially that scene in their apartment 
in the uh, bathroom where the boyfriend was sliced open and shit like that, and then their female friend that you find out wasn't actually killed, but like just that whole setup, it was just so gruesome and violent. Right, right. It was, it was, it was pretty impressive. The body switching is a little silly; would never happen, but that's okay. Yet again, it's a screen movie, and you forgive all this cheesy shit that they throw in there as like conveniences, right? Right, right. But yeah, like I, all in all, like I came out of this way more impressed than i expected to be yeah it's nice you know with, there hasn't been a lot of things that have impressed us this year so that's a good start to it right yeah, <laughs> and so help me something... God, if, if scream six is at the end of the as my top 10 by the end of the year i am gonna be fucking shocked color me shocked right you're gonna be completely like what Correct. i shouldn't say if scream six is, if a scream six scream film in general is in my top 10 i'm gonna be like whoa well <laughs> but, i'm sure like 1990 whatever screams the first scream came out it would have been in your top 10 if you were doing that back then yeah but i did also see a lot of movies back then compared to what i see now true 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 well that comes to the end of this episode of friday nightmares thank you for listening with us um as always i will try to go in and add in the comments the movies that we talked about in 2023 once scott uploads the stuff to facebook um just the order that we talk about them in and usually i just give one place where you can find the movie uh it's so different in the united states and canada around the world so we encourage you to search it out yourself on letterbox or other sources to try to find the film if you're interested in watching it um we are part of the legion podcast network uh we are proud members of that you can find us under legion patreon as well sorry we're under the kill the cast feed and we are also part of Legion Patreon. So you can pay $3 a month for access to early episodes and getting kind of promo codes and other cool stuff. And if you haven't signed up for Legion Patreon yet, Scotty has one question for you. What are you waiting for? <laughs> what, what are you waiting what, what are? What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Seriously, what are you waiting for? Join us. Like, what are you waiting for? We actually like Scream 6. So, like, shit, dude. Anything can happen. Join Legion Patreon. It's 100% true. Will, so true. We'll be back in two weeks. Um, by that point, we will see what else has come out. I am sitting at 50 movies, 51 movies for 2023 watches. I think Scott's sitting at, what, 45? I think, yeah, at 46. 46. So... We're not going to be hitting numbers, 2020 numbers. We will never see 2020 numbers again. Um, but I'm hoping to break 200 this year is my goal, as always. So we'll see what happens. Of course, we'll continue to watch all the Shutter releases, the finest that Tubi has to offer. Uh, Netflix yeah. has really been bringing it this year. So hopefully we'll have more gems from them. Um, theater watches, I think we managed to hit all of those up so far. And, of course, VODs as they come our way. So... Until next time, I guess Scott has some parting words for you. Until next time, kitties. Unpleasant dreams. See ya!